Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 347 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and also an author. Our third book is called From Letters to Leaders, Leveraging Your Fraternity or Sorority Experience to Land Your Dream Job. So go and get that book on Amazon today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food in order to bring college students together. Fun fact, I am a huge fan of the show Shark Tank. It's one of those shows that you can watch with the entire family as entrepreneurs and inventors show off their products to these wealthy investors. Many years ago, my wife and I were actually on a television show with Barbara Corcoran, one of the sharks on the show. And Barbara helped us sell our house in New York super quick. She gave us so many tips when the cameras were not rolling. And that is what impressed us the most. She's as genuine and friendly as you see her on television, while many others on TV, they might only be friendly when the cameras are rolling. Barbara is the real deal. Let's talk to another inventor today on our show. A popular figure in the consumer products and financial services industry, Gene Pranger has created and worked on some of the most well-known products in the world. He was an advertising executive who guided some of the most well-known global brands and new product introductions. He now holds more than 31 U.S. patents for his creations. Ten years ago, Gene developed the Do Something Wonderful protocol to help relieve some of the inner mental turmoil he was experiencing. This self-proven methodology has, proved, has provided a positive lifestyle for those who are suffering from loneliness, isolation, low self-esteem, feelings of entrapment, and general unhappiness to find greater inner peace and sustained happiness. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Hey, listen, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Love talking to a fellow entrepreneur, and uh, I just can't wait to get into your head and start crawling around in there to see what else you're working on. But let's go <laughs> back to the beginning, because I think this is always interesting. You decided on Brigham Young University in Utah, of course, for your undergraduate experience. Tell our audience, why was BYU your choice? Well, when you're a poor high school student, money talks. And... <laughs> And they offered enough money and enough scholarships for me to get into my first year without having to get a student loan. Really, that's the reality. And uh, it seemed to be the easiest course. And when I got to campus, actually, it was a great experience for me. Um, the students are really great. The, the professors were wonderful. And so I stuck around. I, I, I ended up uh, getting my bachelor's degree and then going on to Northwestern after that. And that's where I accumulated all my debt. <laughs> <laughs> so you made up for it later basically. i definitely did i there's there is no amount of scholarships that would ever help you go to northwestern i've decided <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm going through the same drill with my son right now and you know he's got a lot of options super smart kid but i think you know he did some of the mathematical computation and he said dad i'm taking the full ride i'm going to state school <laughs> Well, there's nothing wrong with that. If I were to give advice to college students and sorority students, you know, the state schools can be very, very good venues um, because the competition is a little bit different when you go into an Ivy League school versus local state schools. And if you can make it and you can set yourself apart more easily in state schools as well. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of advantages to staying local. Yeah, I agree. He wants to stay local to be close to his mom, too. So that's always helpful, you know, to have a home cooked meal. But I agree <laughs> with you. And, you know, just looking at the rising cost of student debt, it's, you know, it becomes harder and harder to justify uh, to pay as much money and to be as much debt as we're talking about these days, because the cost has increased significantly since when we were in college. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, that is for sure. I'm to keep in mind. Now, you were an advertising executive. You guided some of the most well-known global brands and new product introductions for companies like Healthy Choice, Anderson Window Centers, Hormel Products, General Mills. These are huge companies. What's your advice to college students who are listening right now who want to make it big in the advertising or marketing space? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, there are so many opportunities in that particular field. And what I really enjoyed about it the most when I when I went into my first agency job is just the level of responsibility that you have relative to other peers that go into other types of jobs. I mean, you're working on multi-million dollar budgets and you're going to, at that time, 
$500,000 video commercial shoots. And today they're even that much more expensive. And plus you get exposed to some great people. You get to travel when you're quite young, uh, pretty liberally for the most part. And, and so there's a lot of advantages that way. But if you want to make a big in what I would call the advertising marketplace, the, the, the tide has shifted a bit in terms of when I entered that category to where people are entering it today. It's all about understanding social media and how to do campaigns surrounding how to target by individual today, as opposed to in mass media where you have advertising that's happening um, in a television or magazine or newspaper. It used to be that way. You can have these broad swaths of marketing messages that go out to a broad range of different people even though you target it on your demographics as well. But today we can drill down very specifically to 18 to 24 year olds. You know, they're at certain colleges and that they have these certain inclinations in terms of what they like to watch and on TikTok or on YouTube or whatever it might be. And so the, the prospects of where people coming into this field today are just unlimited because what's happened really is that in the media field, that you used to have these hundreds of millions of dollars that were going into broadcast television. And now all those budgets are in question today and they're funneled back into social media. And what that means is, is that by being able to, to understand that quarter category really well, you can really capitalize on gaining kind of the commissions associated with the placement of that media and control the media more. And so I would say that there's probably more opportunity to make money in the field if you understand the craft well uh, than it was when I entered the field of advertising because the agencies made all the money. Today, it's agency is a individual sitting in front of a computer screen trying to make it work. But here's the caveat and, and what really separates those that will be successful and those that won't be successful, because it's just not understanting uh, social media, but it's about spinning the story. It's about how to take a messaging and communicating it clearly enough as well as making captivating enough so people absorb the message and act upon it, right? And so I would say if you're good at both of those elements, under, understanding social media and understanding how to spin the story and re-spin a story and then re-spin it again, then you're going to be extremely successful in that field. Wow, that's great insight from a veteran in the industry. I really appreciate that perspective. And you're right, it has changed quite a bit. I mean, uh, you know, advertising on TV is just very different. Uh, people are probably looking more towards live events like uh, football, for example, uh, to spend their advertising money or in social media. I mean, that's where the big money is at right now. That's where all the eyes are glued. So you got to be where the fish are, I guess, so to speak. And I, I would only add on to that, you know, I absolutely loved being in the agency business for almost 10 years. I mean, it was just, it was, it was so much fun, but I would say that the, the funnest thing I ever did was um, this Hormel hot dog jingle that I created for the twins. The twins back in 1991 were in the world series and sports illustrated came out and wanted to do a highlight of a story for them. And I put this promotion in place before that. And the promotion goes like this. You're sitting in the twins game, uh, the middle of the third inning, this Hormel hot dog song would come up. And it says, now that you're at the game, are you in Hormel's row of fame? If you're in the lucky seat, you can win a Hormel hot dog treat. Great for lunch, great for dinner. You could be a wiener winner if you're in Hormel's row of fame. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Sports Illustrator writer came in and and actually gave me the best compliment I've ever been given in my entire professional career. He said, well, the twins look to be doing quite well, but they have this hot dog jingle with quotes, unquotes, in Wiener Winner. <laughs> and uh, he said it was probably the worst hot dog jingle in the history of baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it was memorable. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. That's why it was, that was why it was such a compliment. I took yeah. it. Was like, this guy just did me a favor. Now, the promotion went on to run 25 years, and I never saw another piece that this particular journalist ever wrote again. So, <laughs> so you can see what outlived what, right? Yeah, you were the big winner. You got the last <laughs> laugh on that. That's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now you hold over 31 US patents, trademarks and copyrights. The big one that you did is around video banking. Tell mm -hmm. us what did you invent there? Well, back in 
1995, I ventured out of the advertising business and went into and started my own firm. And this was because one of the clients uh, came up to me. Uh, it was um, it was Norwest Bank, which turned into Wells Fargo Bank, asked me that they had a branch in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. And they asked me to take a look at the branch and see if I could put a team together to redesign it. And so I did. And um, and the result is is history. They liked it so much that I thought, well, I don't have to work in the agency business. I can do my own thing, right? So I, I was one of the very first people that started a business that concentrates on the design and creation of retail banks, uh, which banks were not known for retailing at that point. And and so I went into that field. Over time, I noticed that the banks were very interested in creating efficiencies within their system. How do you think make things more efficient, not just from an operations standpoint, but allow accessible points for their consumers or guests that are coming inside those branches. And so eventually I designed a branch on the campus of UCLA, believe it or not. And um, it was right next to the student union building. And inside that building, I had an, the very first interactive video um, system, and it was sitting next to a traditional teller system. And I thought, oh, all I need to do is combine interactive video with a traditional teller, put the teller back in their corporate headquarters somewhere. They can conduct the transaction and have an ATM-like device in front of it that could dispense cash, accept cash, and dispense coin. So that's what I ended up doing. I thought, it, well, I should back up. Is that I had the idea, but then as many small business owners know at that particular time, I was missing one element and that was money. I didn't have enough money to actually make that a reality and you need a client. Well, about three years later, I was visiting with another client in Raleigh, North Carolina with Coastal Federal Credit Union and they wanted to embrace that concept. And so now I had a business partner, right, to bring this to reality and a, almost a financing partner to a great extent. And so I started creating an idea. The very first 1.0 ver version was a complete failure. Um, and then I reinvented it again. And second and 2.0 version was a success. Um, and that ended up leading from one financial institution to another. And then eventually I sold that company to NCR back in 2012. Um, but like all good things, and everybody will figure this out as they go through their professional career, the very first thing, the very worst thing you can do is retire. You never want to do that. It's like retirement, uh, when people say they're ready to rest, it means that they're ready to rust. And you don't want to rust, right? <laughs> so I was itching to get back into the business world. And so I created mobile video banking then. And I just sold that to a venture capital firm just about six months ago out of Los Angeles. So the whole concept of video banking is the ability to be able to see and talk to a banker, whether it's for a transaction or a loan or a mortgage or whatever it might be, but still be able to do that over your phone handset over today or interactive video components that might be inside the branch or inside an office inside the branch. And it's been very successful. Very cool. I like it. I'm also going to be working forever. As long as I'm above ground, just keep me working. You well, you and I will be out there with our canes. <laughs> whatever. I mean, yeah. hey, whatever it takes. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I want to be productive. I want to do something. I want to help some way, you know, society. I mean, I, plus I don't play golf. So what else am I going to do? <laughs> well, and that's, I'll tell you what, I've tried picking up golf, I mean, but the one thing that everybody should know that unless you're a really excellent athlete, it destroys your self-confidence completely. <laughs> and so <laughs> I finally made a hole in one three years ago and that was it. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> That's it. I'm just leaving right now because it can't get any better than this. <laughs> I love it. That's really good. All right. So you are the creator and the author of the book. It's called The Do Something Wonderful Protocol. I know the book is scheduled to be released on June 13th. How did you come up with this methodology for the book? Well, unfortunately, it was born out of um, some pain points in my life. Um, uh, the, the, the biggest one, which um, that was kind of the triggering event that caused me to think that things just aren't right was something that happened with my father. Um, this goes almost 30 years back now, is that imagine yourself on the phone inside your kitchen and you're talking to police officers 2,000 miles away and he lived out in Oregon and they were making a welfare call on my father um, who had called me earlier in the day 
uh, and it sounded like a final goodbye. And I, it just, it unsettled me so much that I sent the police department over to see kind of what was going on. And they were, I just, this is a real as testament to me how law enforcement can be such a benefit to a community because they really assisted me. They could have just ignored me completely, but they took my, um, my, my admonition seriously. They went over to his house. They found him unconscious on a bed. Um, and they had to call an ambulance who was taken to the state mental hospital in uh, Salem. And I was kept on thinking to myself, how in the world did we get here? How, how did this happen? And because the day before I had talked to him, he seemed to be fine. Um, but I just couldn't understand how something could go so awry so quickly in his life. And he was working by himself. He was isolated. He was lonely. He got frustrated and he just had enough. Right. And so he decided to act out on on his feelings at that particular time. And then I noticed that when I first sold my first business, I didn't have that extent of problems. But I noticed that I was kind of going through that same type of that isolation and loneliness that sometimes comes along with people that don't really have enough to do in their lives. Right. And so I decided that I was going to change the process of how I looked at life. And and that's what where the do something wonderful protocol comes from. It was born from those two various different activities. And and the concept behind this is that we ask people to do four to five acts of kindness during the course of the week when they're thinking about others or something else outside of themselves. So it might be in service to people, but it also might be just doing activities related to cleaning things up or or taking a dog on a walk or whatever it might be, and then focusing on yourself once or twice each week. So it's a both it's both the creation of a giving mindset, focusing on other people, and then focusing on yourself and making sure that your needs and your self-care is being addressed with time as well. And in that balance, there seems to be the right formula and the right, right approach where there's an entire elevation, elevation that takes place in a person's heart and soul and mind that they begin thinking more optimistically. They begin having more positive thoughts. They gain greater confidence um, in how they approach life. And so I decided at that point to put in a more formal process, and that's where the book is derived from, is I created this 100-day challenge that we give people uh, to actually work their way through that challenge of giving them the opportunity of focusing on others four to five times each week, and then focusing on themselves once or twice each week. And my commitment to people, if they do that, they will have a complete change in perspective and the quality of their life will improve dramatically. Hmm. That sounds really fascinating. Give us an example of an activity. You mentioned the 100 day challenge. What, give us an example of an activity that college students would enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this well, this will be a, a good one for everybody here. Um, I have a I have a, a restaurant that's not too far from where I am, and you can do this absolutely anywhere. But um, I had some leftovers, and um, I decided that I was going to take it home. and And so I asked this waiter, uh, "Could you give me the smallest doggy bag? It was just like two pieces of sushi. That's all it was. Can you just give me a small doggy bag so I can take this home?" and he ended up bringing me the smallest possible doggy bag that you can possibly ever imagine. It was a small <laughs> plastic soy sauce cup with a plastic lid. And I thought that absolutely is one of the funniest thing I've ever seen. But believe it or not, my sushi fit perfectly in this cup, which I think was even more ironic. <laughs> but I took a picture of him and then I had this illustration made of him, uh, of what he ended up doing. The next night, I brought the picture back uh, to the restaurant to give it to him. I had it framed. And I wrote a little inscription on it, um, and he wasn't there. I, I didn't. I didn't know exactly what had happened, but I left the 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 photo along with the frame there with him or with the maitre d. And it was about two months later that I went back to the restaurant, and Oscar was there, and I was taking a small business group back to the restaurant. And I said, Oscar, did you did you receive the picture that I dropped off? And he said, that was you. You did that. And and he relived the whole experience. He had taken this picture and he put it above his dresser at home. He's obviously a 22 year old uh, young man. 
And he looks at it every single night. And he had this enthusiasm, this brightness in his eyes, this, this, captiva this captivation associated with how what a kind act that was. Um, and I was with three other people that were completely foreign to what was going on, right? And so they started getting involved after um, um, Oscar left. And they said, so why, why did he come up to you? And what, what did you do? And it was amazing how contagious his enthusiasm was with the rest of the group. Um, and, and the side bonus is that he gave our table a free dessert. So... <laughs> So we get we did have that bonus. Now the dessert didn't make any difference in the world to me, right? It was the it was his enthusiasm and joy that he had in sharing the experience with uh, with uh, me again and reliving the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one, right? That's just one activity of a hundred different types of activities that I went through. Now today, you know, today it's not uncommon for me to go th through this exercise two or three times every day. Because it's just not a matter of doing something like this, you know, where you create an illustration or something. It can, it's just a matter of being nice and kind and reaching out. Everyone wants to be acknowledged and validated. Absolutely every single person. And you worked in New York City. You sure. know that people don't make eye contact in New York City. Despite that, everybody wants to be acknowledged and validated. They want to be seen as having worth and that they have contributions to make to society or to their family or to their business or to their sorority or fraternity, whatever it might be. And so you just have to go in life thinking that someone may be disconnected for a time being, but I am going to engage with people and I'm going to make a difference for them somehow. Um, and so it's it, it's a, it's a just a wonderful, fulfilling activity to do, no matter what area of your life you're in, whether you're at the college level, or if you're in a career, or if you're in high school or in grade school, it doesn't make any difference. It, it's applicable to everybody. Hmm. I really like this idea. You know, now you mentioned some of the benefits there of using this methodology. I mean, what's the what's the application of this book? Who's the ultimate end user for this book? Is it everybody? Well, it definitely is, I think, a broad audience. I mean, it goes, this this goes across demographic, psychographic characteristics to every single individual, because we all have a human need to be recognized and acknowledged. We mentioned that before, mm -hmm. but we all have a need to be part of a community, right? And if we're not part of a community, we'll be isolated and that will be um, feelings, uh, we'll have feelings of lonely, loneliness that will lead to lack of self-confidence that will lead to self-esteem issues. I mean, and you can see this readily. I mean, 67% of all U.S. people are dealing with issues of loneliness. Can you imagine that? 67% of us can, and more than, it was just measured earlier this year, more people in the United States are unhappy than happy in the United States. So unless we do something, unless we change the trajectory and we pull the trigger on something else to make us more proactive in terms of how we engage with people, I don't see that trajectory changing in a positive direction. And so this is the one opportunity, I think, that we have to step back and say, can we reset? Can we reboot? The, the great news, Michael, here, and for everybody that's listening to this podcast, is that your influence can influence 10 other people, right? Your influence to making a positive difference in a person's life on a single day will mean that they'll go home happier and more fulfilled and they will share that experience with somebody else somehow. You know, it might be a nice message to their spouse or girlfriend, or it might be um, just being sitting down and playing with their children for five or 10 minutes where they would previously ignore the opportunity completely. Mm -hmm. And so I think it really has a downstream type of effect. The, the better we're at, at, um, at performing these acts of kindness, um, the more ripple effect will happen downstream. Now, I also just wanna reemphasize that when you go through this process, it's really important to make sure that you take care of yourself as well and you recognize yourself and you treat yourself appropriately. So if there's something that you enjoy doing in life, whether it might be skiing or it might be skateboarding or it might be whatever, skydiving, I don't know what people do today um, in terms of all the activities. I've had to eliminate some activities from my schedule <laughs> because of fear of death primarily. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or injury, permanent injuries. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that um, that this whole self-care notion is really critical important importance because and you see this as particularly among the female gender where they spend so much time giving and serving and and providing um these service relative to other people that they get burned out and these these points become almost complications for them they're just not enjoying themselves and so they have to take a step back, making sure everybody has to take, make a step back and making sure that they treat them as a human and an individual and that they're valuable, important, and they go out and do what they enjoy doing. And there's the opposite side of this spectrum as well. And you see this often, especially with people that are affluent. Sometimes they have so much money, they can do absolutely anything that they want. They can go anywhere they choose to. But that's a problem in and of itself, right? Because how do they treat, typically use that money? They're buying boats and airplanes and going on expensive trips and expensive dinners. And they're thinking about me, myself, and then I, me, myself, and I, and me, myself, and I. There is a degree of self-care that I think is critical and important to develop, but there is a thing that's too much. And, and where you actually think too, ex too internally about yourself, where you're not thinking enough about the other person. And so the goal here is creating this mindset, this giving mindset, and then giving to yourself, as opposed to thinking the world was created for me and everybody should serve me, <laughs> which is a completely different problem, right? Yes, that's definitely a whole different problem. I really love this idea. I think it's something that fraternity and sorority members can adopt. I think it's something that they can implement on their campuses in order to spread happiness on their college campus. And I also think that other people are going to look at this just like the other people around your table might have looked at your act of kindness. And I think other people are going to want to join them in this pursuit. So do you think this methodology would be helpful in getting new students to join an organization? Well, I, you know, it's just like joining a business or any social group or uh, whether it be a fraternity or a sorority or whatever it might be, you don't want to hang out with a, with a bunch of people that are constantly going to be belittling you and judging you and putting you down or, or creating these boxes is that you're in this box until you get a certain seniority level. The goal here is, is that, again, everybody wants to be part of a community. And the more that you develop that community by being um, actively involved in another person's life, it means that they're going to look up to you differently. They're going to look up to you not just as a role model. They'll look to you as being a friend, a mentor, a guide, a coach, however you want to phrase that. Um, and everybody wants to have a trusted friend that they can rely upon at certain points of their life. And so if you can create that ideal environment through the application of the Do Something Wonderful protocol, you're going to have a very powerful group of people, not just in the community in terms of the time that you're together in the university itself, mm -hmm. but this is going to last on into generations, right? This is going to last two or three generations because people will always remember that. Um, they will always remember the, 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 kind, the kind acts and the acts of friendship and trust, but they have a hard time uh, leaving alone in a positive way these negative experiences that they end up having. And so if you can create this positive environment for people, given freedom to be able to explore and to learn and to have friendships, boy, wouldn't that make a difference? You not only, you not only can recruit the type of people that you're looking for, but you can give them the springboard where they're going to be very successful in life and allow them to be able to contribute in a very meaningful way. Wow. That is absolutely fantastic. I love everything about it. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and, you know, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie podcast. I know you're in the Salt Lake City area and I'm told there are a couple of good restaurants in the neighborhood. What's your favorite restaurant in town? Well, I would say that this, actually this restaurant that I show this illustration is called Mint uh, Tapas and Sushi. Okay. And so they have these small little tapas dishes, as you're well aware, and they have sushi that is really extraordinary at that particular location. And just literally a block away is my second favorite restaurant. It's called Taburin. And at that restaurant, they serve these elk steaks. And it's a very one of the few places you can actually get an elk steak. And it's obviously grass fed because of, you know, how it's fed and things of that nature. So, and the quality of the meat is just 
really, really excellent. And so, and I only eat grass fed meat when I do eat meat. So it's not very often, but uh, those are my two favorite places. And if you come to Salt Lake city, they're a block and a half away from each other. <laughs> I can hit both in the same, <laughs> yes, in the same <laughs> night or lunch and dinner, however lunch you choose. And dinner. To out. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. I really like that. So I will definitely check it out next time I'm in Utah. This okay. is great. So if our student listeners, if they want to buy your book on June 13th, maybe they want to connect with you as a speaker on their college campus, where should they go to connect with you? Well, go to do something wonderful.com. That's probably the best place. And there is a speaking uh, section on that particular um, um, uh, website as well. And then the book, the book comes out on June 13th and they can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble website and get it there. We're going to come out with a soft cover first and then the hard cover full, full color version will come out in September because we have about 120 illustrations that are in the book as well, similar to the one that I just showed to you. Very nice. I'm looking forward to reading it as soon as it comes out. I can't wait to get my copy. So thank you so much for sharing all this great information with us today, Gene. Oh, it's been an honor. I, I absolutely love talking about the subject. And Michael, I can't say enough about what you're doing for your cause. So congratulations. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Gene. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this talk with Gene, make sure that you like it, make sure you share it on social media, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next time.